Today's teaching text comes from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 11. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given, through the Spirit, a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So that 1 Corinthians 12 text is the whole of that is what we're going to jump into today. As you're just coming in, I know some folks jumped in a little bit later again. Uh, before we jump in, I just want to say again, my name's Seth and I'm a pastor here at Wellspring. Um, and I'm just encouraged so greatly by what we're seeing God do in and through this church. Um, many of the things we are reading and seeing even in these texts in fresh and new ways, we are seeing be made manifest in our community through the love of Jesus simply because I believe he, he is breathing new life into our community. We're finding ourselves in the midst of a Be Healed series, which I am enjoying. Um, It's been wonderful. It's been hard, even in in preparation sometimes, because some of the things that come to the surface are things that God is calling us to to fully uh, reconcile ourselves with. But it's also been really beautiful, and we've seen that play out in people's lives. We've seen it start to play out in people's marriages and in different homes. And I'm just so encouraged because the, the heart of what we've been seeing God doing And the heart of what this teaching even of of being healed is about is that we as a church are trying to spur one another on and to hold one another accountable and to rise our level of faith into believing and taking Jesus at his word when he came onto the scene and he said the kingdom of God is at hand. He said the kingdom of God has come near. And he said that because he himself, God himself came down in the form of a man Right? He embodied man. He lived that perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins and rose again. So that the, therefore the dysfunction, the brokenness of the world could then be put right. It could be made whole. It could be actually healed and repaired. So the brokenness of the world, the brokenness in our own bodies, the brokenness in our lives. He comes so that that can be healed and repaired. And we, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, have been given the Holy Spirit and God's desire because just this is how he chooses to work. It's through people. The, the delivery method for that healing, his desire is for that to take place by his power through the people that call upon his name. Now we live in this time where that is not fully realized, but it started to happen. Right? And we live in the tension of this place. The tension of that place where where Jesus has come and we are given the Holy Spirit and yet the full healing that we're talking about and longing for won't come again until he returns. And so we are in the midst of the broken in the midst of the brokenness, but we're seeing the glory of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is drawing near. And today we're looking at, in particular in this Be Healed series, at that healing process, at the, the gifts of healing. Notice it said gifts of healing that's referenced in the scripture in our text today the actual physical healing aspect of those. Like healing our physical bodies. Physical healing. And even just the mention of that in the church. I know for some of us, uh, well, some of us, I think it makes us excited. Like excited because we have started to see stories of this breakout in the church in a greater way. Excited because there's things that you've been longing for and asking for to be used in this way. I think some of us actually just carry physical pain that we are longing to be freed from. There, there are illnesses and diseases and things that are wrong that we are believing in faith that can be healed. 
I think you, you mentioned that, of course, though, and there's nervousness. It seems a little bit out there. It seems a little far-fetched. It seems a little too good to be true. And I think also for some of us, honestly, right, there's some hurt. Uh, there's some doubt in this area. There's some pain because of unanswered prayer, because of times where we have believed in faith and not seen this work out. And again, I think that is that tension that we're talking about in these areas of healing, like everything we've been talking about, healing our past, healing us from sin, healing our souls, and even physical healing, that we live in that tension or where we are seeing miracles come through and break through. But at the same time, there's this idea that it isn't fully happening quite yet in the way that we are longing to see it. And look, I think for some of us it's exciting because obviously physical healing is one of the most supernatural of the gifts Right? When God shows off in this way in physical healing, there is so much joy, there's so much delight, there's so much celebration. When I have seen God move in this way, it's some of the best times I've ever had with God in my life. Like in my faith journey, when God shows off in this way, it is the best of times. But it's also really tough. Because I believe in particular, this topic today of physical healing embodies that tension of what Paul talks about with that already but not yet. Probably perhaps more than any other topic that we could talk about. Because as we're saying, the truth is sometimes people are healed and it's, and it's supernatural. And sometimes people are not healed. And that's hard. And that's mysterious. And I'll just want to be honest, fully, as fully as I can be, that I do not have the answer for that. I do not understand why in some cases we pray and God moves in power and and people are healed and at other times we pray and it it seems to be we are faith-filled and it's certainly not on the person um, and they're not healed. And if it's any consolation, as I've been praying about this and wondering it, and it's kind of going to be a lifelong journey, I think, for all of us of living in that tension of the miraculous breaking in in the midst of the brokenness. If if it's any consolation for you, uh, I think it's important to note that the apostles themselves sat with this exact same tension that we're sitting in this morning. This isn't unique to us here in 2019. Right? I think in particular of, of two of Jesus' closest friends, right? You had the three, Peter, James, and John, who are like the tight ones, right? They got to go with Jesus uh, a little bit further in the garden. They were up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Like these were his best friends. These were his, his comrades, Right? These are the ones that experienced more than anybody the miracles, the glorification of Jesus. These men went on to do many amazing miracles themselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. They, they, they healed people. They evangelized nations. They did amazing works in the name of God. They dedicated their entire life to the mission of God. And yet, as we read in Scripture, and if you look at, at church history a little bit, I'll look at Peter and James in particular. Right, Two of the three, two of Jesus' closest friends. Well, as, as the story goes, both of them find themselves in prison at different times because of their faith in the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And people gathered and they prayed and these men prayed and they were praying for them to be released. And so Peter is in prison, right? And people gather and they pray and what happens? The jail cells shake and burst and break open and Peter walks out and he's completely free. And then James is in prison. Right? And the same thing happens. People gather in faith and they're believing and they are praying for James to be set free. And what happens? Well, the jail cell doesn't break open. As we find out, actually, the very next day, he's beheaded for his faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Right? Why are some people healed and some people not? That's a mystery. And, and obviously, it's certainly not because of the lack of faith. I'm pretty sure Jesus liked James a lot, too. It's not because somebody is better or worse than another, and I know that could be used and misused uh, in the church and has been. But honestly, when you look at the whole of Scripture, what you can see through the through line, even though there are obviously places of brokenness and there's obviously places where things are not as they're supposed to be, the default of God and the default of our Savior from the beginning of Scripture to the end of Scripture is that his default is healing. He longs for everybody to ultimately be healed. He wants them to be healed in every way, through the supernatural, through the natural of giftings through others, from doctors and other places, ultimately to the whole healing of all of creation. And he wants all of us to be part of it. That's his default. That's what he's going after. But it's the already, but the not yet. And that kind of healing, even the miraculous supernatural kind of healing has happened today. Right? It's not just for stories in the past. We are seeing it happen and take place in this room, in the community center, on the streets, in this church. 
Miracles are still breaking through and ushering in the kingdom of God in our midst because God's default is healing, just like they did in the early church. But I think in particular the Western church of today, the enemy has used kind of that discouragement in particular around the idea of the existing brokenness that we're still experiencing. And he's also used the doubts we have because of our intellectualism and our desire to kind of control things. I think in particular in America, we're really great at like getting a framework and then trying to control that framework. And I think he's using that, the enemy is, to deeply dampen and hold back Christians from boldly stepping into the gifts that God desires to pour out. But I also believe at that same time where we've experienced that dampening of that boldness of faith that God could still move, we are also now seeing faith start to rise. But it's starting to rise, but like God's doing it in a gentle way. But he's also being very clear, I sense, that he's inviting us as the church to once again discover the beauty and the joy of participating with him in this ministry of healing. And by healing, I mean physical healing for all people. That's part of his mission. And it's not just a, that he does this as a preview, which I think he does, right? A preview is like a foretaste of the kingdom that is to come. But I also think so it's a sign of the already. So it's not just the not yet, but this will be, but it's a sign of the kingdom breaking in in the already in right now. And T. Wright talks about it like this. He's a short quote where he says, when Jesus healed people, he intended it to be clear that this wasn't just a foretaste of a future reality. This was reality itself. This is what it looked like when God was in charge. God's kingdom was coming as he taught his followers to pray on earth as it is in heaven. And we can do that today. We can experience that today because of the gift of the Holy Spirit who thanks to Jesus, he's he's been given to us. And he gives that to us through the spiritual gifts as we read about in our text today. And I just want to take a moment uh, before we dive into that in particular to just, just briefly talk about spiritual gifts as a whole for us as a church. Right, if we were to sum it up, we could just say spiritual gifts, what are they? Well, they're an expression of Jesus' heart. They're an expression of Jesus' character that he gives to anybody who follows him so that, that they then can be his hands and feet in the world. Right, they're, they're gifts, something that's a blessing, something that's part of our inheritance for, for becoming his kids so that we can then be a tangible expression now of Jesus Christ here in New York City. And, and all of us, if you, have, if you have proclaimed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you have confessed that and believed that in your heart, that he died and rose again and he's now Lord of your life, you have been given spiritual gifts. So what are those gifts, right? Well, we listed a bunch of them today. And if you want to look into it even more, um, and we'll talk about that probably at a further date, but Paul gives them in four places in particular in Romans, two different places in 1 Corinthians and also in Ephesians. And each time he actually kind of gives off this list, they're a little bit different, right? They're not all the same, and sometimes there's some overlap, which kind of leads us to believe as we read it that these are not meant to be a comprehensive list of all the gifts, but rather he's just, he's rattling off these gifts of saying these are available, this, this is coming off of his heart, as he's just, he's penning these words, and he's saying um, these are the gifts that are available to all who believe. In the, the text we read, read today in 1 Corinthians 12, it's probably the most prolific text on the gifts, right? It gives the most exhaustive list. But again, I just want to point out again that these are gifts, right? They are given. That's different than the fruits of the Spirit, which are grown by the Spirit in our life. These are gifts that are given by the Father. So it's all about grace. It's not about works. It's not about maturity. It's not about achievement. These are gifts. And God gives them, as the text says, as he sees fit. So there's no hierarchy in gifts. They're all equal. And they're all given to edify and to give away to each other. As the scripture said, God gives them for the building up of the common good. He is a good father and he gives gifts so that we can build one another up and we can build up the world that we can be hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. And what I love so much about Jesus is he's so specific that he seems to continually give gifts to his children that specifically meet the needs of the cultural moment in that time. And it seems to be even lately in our church in particular, some of these gifts of the prophetic and of physical healing are gifts that seem to be bubbling up more and more in our midst. Now look again, too, we don't all have all the gifts, but I do believe that we all have access to all of them. I do believe it's possible for us to continue to grow and and develop our strengths in certain giftings, and we can develop those strengths as we put those into practice. And at the same time, as God sees fit, we are able to receive new gifts as we grow and walk with him as he sees fit. And this morning, uh, I want to zero in, in particular, like we said, on this gifts of healing 
Because the gifts of healing are truly such a large part of Jesus' ministry, right? 20 to 25% of the gospels are in reference to the ministry of healing, actually. That's a massive part of what Jesus came to do. It's actually one of the most widely used gifts throughout the entire New Testament. It's not only something that Jesus himself did prolifically, but then he empowered his disciples to also participate in this ministry. And it's something that we regularly see throughout the early church and in Acts. And yet it remains one of the least talked about and expressed gifts in the Western church today. And not like I said, these other areas of healing that we've been talking about through this series are sinfulness and, and our, 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 our past. The working out of this ministry gift, this physical healing gift, ties back into as a whole, as we're working through these healing processes, just to our discipleship of Jesus. Or as some people call it, our apprentices, to apprenticeship to Jesus. What does it mean simply to follow Jesus and be a disciple? And as we say in this church, we, we narrow it down to three things, right? We want to be with Jesus. That's where it starts. It all starts with relationship, in his presence. Find yourself in his presence. And then to become more like Jesus, right? And that involves repentance. That re involves actually lifestyle change. That involves a heart change and walking in a different way. And then ultimately to do what Jesus did. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He preached the kingdom of God all the time. He cast out demons and he healed the sick. And the contention of scripture is that that's not only possible, but it's actually a mandate for his followers. And we participate in that through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But I'll just be honest that, that walking in that empowerment in particular requires a lot of faith. Right? It requires just like stepping out in courage in response to the move of Jesus in your life. Uh, I love how it's often shared in particular when you start to talk about any of the supernatural gifts. It gets a little weird. Uh, a lot of people say that faith in this area really could just be spelled R-I-S-K. Risk. It's just that it does involve some level of risk. And it involves risk for a number of reasons. Uh, but I'll just list a few that, kinda, that I think come all, up all the time. And it's first that you just really don't have a lot of control in this area, right? There's certain areas in ministry that you perhaps could kind of fake or as a Christian, you know, was that really God? Is that really me just kind of controlling the situation? But what comes to an act like a physical healing, uh, either God shows up in power and he does something or it's not. It's not like we can fake that kind of thing. It also happens that we can, we can get it wrong, like we can fail, we can sense that God wants to do something, or we can really long and believe for something to happen, and it just doesn't happen, and that's because we're imperfect. That's because this world is still broken, that spiritual warfare is a very real, real thing, and there's also just plans of the Lord that we do not understand, that his ways are higher than our ways. I'll be honest, in this area, even as God calls me into it more and more, I fail more often than I'm successful. I, I, I could, uh, was joking with another pastor, I should start a new, like, not healing ministry, and I'd be very successful at it. And then for, for many of us, and I think this is a huge one in today's culture, that we're just driven um, by our own experience so much, right? Culturally, we look at our own experience and what I'm feeling and what I've experienced in my years on this planet and what I see happening in my friend's life, in my family's life, and I'm declaring that as truth, and therefore, we don't carry an expectation that perhaps there is something that we've not yet experienced that perhaps is a greater truth. And therefore, this kind of thing, supernatural gifting, and the gifts of healing aren't even in our framework of belief. John Wimber, uh, a pastor who had kind of a, a, a very a strong testimony in this area, says this about that idea. He says, we see according to our expectations. Many times, our expectations come from conditioning. We are taught to expect certain things in the Christian life and miss what God is doing if he acts outside of our expectations. Are we missing it sometimes? Or another author says this, it is interesting and discouraging to note that even though we are Christians, our basic assumptions are usually more like those of the non-Christian Westerners around us than we would like to admit. Even though there is a wide discrepancy between the teaching of scripture and the common Western assumptions, we often find ourselves more Western than scriptural. Western societies pass through the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and a wide variety of ripples and spin-offs from these movements. The result, God and the church were dethroned, and the human mind came to be seen as Savior. You see, I believe God is calling us into deeper expectations as a community. Deeper expectations of what is possible through him. And as I said, we are actually seeing God do exciting things in this church. And not just in this church, but act through the West again. 
Amazing things happening in Ireland, amazing things in Europe, in these, in these societies that have long been um, over and above or think we are beyond these places. Amazing things happen in, in cities across, uh, across America, in particular in Portland and in Los Angeles and in San Francisco and in New York. And I believe that that's because we are starting to find that in all our intellectual study, I don't know if you're here with this, right, in all of our technological, all, all our sociological advances, that it's still just not cutting it. That, that what the world needs is not just another good nonprofit that can do some marginal good in the community, but we need the power of God. And I believe God is saying, I'm bringing a fresh revelation of my Holy Spirit back into the forefront. And I'm going to do that through the gifts of the Spirit because I love you and I want you to be filled and I want you to be free and I want you to be healed. Jesus came to save us. So let me just frame that within that, right? Save us, to transform brokenness into wholeness. That's what saving means. Jesus himself, Luke 19.10 says this, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. That's what he came to do. And that word there, save, translated as uh, from sozo. And that sozo, that word there, means the totality of a person. And this is, this is pivotal for us in this, and I'm just gonna talk about it a little bit here. So the totality of a person, that means saving, of course, that's forgiveness of sins, right? The soul, the spiritual. That's freedom from torment. But that's also freedom in physical healing from pain and from disease. God came to save the totality of mankind and of creation. So that sozo word is used throughout the entire New Testament. A few places, right? Mark 6, we see it used directly in relationship to physical healing. He's, we see this, and wherever he went into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. That's a form of sozo right there. Or in Matthew 9, with the woman with the issue of blood, he says, Jesus turned and he saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you, has healed Sozo. And the woman was healed, another form of Sozo, at that moment. See, I think there's this tendency in, in Christians in particular that we, just because we get conditioned, right, as it said, we limit the gospel to just declaring that we are sinful and broken people, which we all are, we all know that. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And then Jesus came, and then he saved us from that. We are forgiven. But this idea of salvation is so much bigger than that. Right? The story of God began in the Garden of Eden in perfect unity. Right? The story began with unity and relationship and no fear and no death and no sickness and no pain. Right? And then the very ending of the story in Revelation, it's not just a, a, a saving from our moral sin that we see at the end, but it's the renewal of all things. It's God's heart for recreation of the restoration of all that was broken in this world. You see, our God is not a God who just forgives, but he forgives and then he restores. Right? He restores all of life to the way that it was supposed to be. We see that throughout the Old and the New Testament. Right? This is the story of God. This is the heart of God. I'll just one, one glimpse from King David, right? This beautiful 103rd Psalm where he says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Pray, he goes, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not, not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. And then we see that same heart again through Jesus' ministry in a uniquely powerful way. Right? Healing and deliverance and forgiveness is just breaking out all over the place. And then we see that extended to the early church and in Acts. And then at the very end of the story, at Revelation 21, where we read about the new heaven and the new earth, we see this grand vision again of salvation that encompasses our unity and relationship with God for eternal life, yes, but also for physical healing, for the, for the repairing of all that was broken. Revelation 21 says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and we will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Jesus came to save us, to transform brokenness into wholeness. And I just want to focus in right specifically on Jesus because he's the pivot point. Right? It is in and through him that all things fit together. 
And I think what we see when we look at the ministry and the work of Jesus is that we have not just been saved from our sin, but we've actually been saved for a purpose. And that purpose is to be united with God and then to partner with him in the restoring and the renewing of all things in this world. Right? He saves us into relationship with him. He gives us his Holy Spirit, and then with that comes purpose for your life. It comes identity for who you truly are. It becomes calling for you and for your family. And he actually gives us all kinds of language and metaphor to describe this exact thing all throughout his ministry. He says things like this. I just pulled a few. He says, you are now part of my body. He says, you are my hands and my feet. He says, you are my sons and my daughters. That means we are also heirs to the kingdom. He says, you are a royal priesthood. He says, you are salt and light in this world. And his plan is to restore all things, and he's calling us to be part of it, and we participate that, in that through the gifts of the Spirit that he's given us. That's his plan. Jesus came onto the scene, and I love this about Jesus. He makes it very, very clear. He declares his purpose, right? He comes on and he says, I have come to seek and save the lost. I've come to bind up the brokenhearted. I've come to heal the sick, to, pray, to proclaim good news to the poor. So Matthew chapter 4, we'll take it right to the beginning of the Gospels there. The onset of Jesus' ministry. He comes onto the scene and he begins preaching by saying this, Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. And then the very next thing we see him doing is that he calls his first disciples. And they come and join him in his ministry. He says this, Matthew 4, 19. He says, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And I just want you to notice that that's something Jesus does from the very beginning of his ministry. After he comes onto the scene, he says, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, for I am here. And then he goes out and gets some disciples and he asks them to come and join him in his ministry. Right off the bat, he's inviting others in to come and participate in what he is doing. And then immediately, three verses later, once he's called those initial disciples, he said, we see this. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And then in Luke 9, we see Luke, uh, Jesus expand this power and authority, and he gives this ministry out to his 12 now. In Luke 9, he says this, When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And then a, a little bit later in Luke 10, we see that Jesus now widens it even further from the 12, and he sends out the 72 where he says this, after this, the Lord had appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. And notice he commands them. He sends them out. He doesn't say, hey, I just want you to go out there and if you, if you have some courage or you see somebody who might need, uh, need to hear the gospel or, or be healed of something, you could pray for them if you'd like. No, he says, no, go, I'm commanding you. I am sending you out. And then, of course, we get to the various texts about the Great Commission as Jesus is ascending to heaven, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Acts 1, and he's speaking to all of his followers now, which includes us, right? So he's gone from himself to the 12, to the 72, to all of his followers, and he says things like this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Obey everything I have commanded you. And we see this very much then begin to play out as the church is birthed in Acts. And I give us that rundown and that whole vision of we're seeing this progression in the ministry of Jesus because I want us to understand that this healing conversation is probably so much bigger than we tend to make it. Right? It's not just wishful thinking. It's not just a spiritual band-aid or a coping mechanism that we use and that we get to have until we ultimately get to heaven. Praying for healing in Jesus' name is an act of obedience. Praying for healing in Jesus' name is actually a faithful defiance against the plans and the schemes of the enemy that wants to keep this world broken. And it's a declaring that the breaking into the kingdom is actually coming due to the victory of Jesus on the cross. And because of Jesus, we now have been given the authority to participate in this ministry. Because it's a gift. It's a gift. 
But as we said, too, like, honestly, especially in the U.S., we're not seeing a lot of it today, though we are starting to see more and more of it. And I believe there's, there's three things that, I just want, that can help us um, move, I guess, in a direction of faithfulness, because that's what we're trying to do, right? Just be a faithful church, hear what God is saying, take him at his word, and step forward in bold faithfulness. Um, but please hear me, too. This isn't a, a, um, like a, a how-to by any means. Each time I think anybody tries to go to Scripture and really give you a how-to, you just look at the next story of Jesus, and he kind of shatters everything that you were thinking about what he's up to. I'll talk about that in a second. So maybe just see these kind of things as uh, a help helpful uh, framework and the first one is expectation right that's where I want to start the first one is expectation I'm just going to roll through three things expectation do we expect as a church do you expect in your life this kind of thing to happen right, we've already kind of touched on that and how we often find ourselves more western than scriptural I'll be honest it's like a huge part of my testimony with my own experience with the Holy Spirit and I had this theological understanding of the Holy Spirit. I had a framework for how I thought God moved in, 20, uh, in 2019 or whatever, whenever this was for me. It was years ago. Uh, I, I thought I had a framework for how God moves in modern times. And he just didn't seem to work and move in the same ways until he started to convict me of that. And I started to pursue after him um, with my heart. And he was gracious to me. And I had had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I saw the works of the Spirit taking place in places you would not expect. And it forever changed my view on what it means to find yourself in the presence of God. It forever changed my life as I was filled with the Holy Spirit and understand that God was saying, there's so many beautiful things the church is doing now, but there's so many more beautiful things that are coming. I think so many of us today believe that uh, we put our faith or our life in this place of this is what I've experienced and therefore this is truth but we're believing our personal experiences over and above the promises of God that are in the Bible. And I think for some of us, there are things that we have yet to experience. I know for a fact there are things we have yet to experience even in this church, but it doesn't mean that they're not true, and it doesn't mean that they're not for us. And I believe we're being called into new expectation for God to move. I told you I have this great, great ministry of unhealing right? I have the school of unhealing that plays out in my life all the time as I step out and bold this, but there also was a time just a few short weeks ago where one of my best friends actually was experiencing a lot of pain because of a disease that he has, and it was attacking his hips, and I got to pray for him, and God healed him, and it removed his pain in an instant, and it hasn't come back, and that step of faithfulness and seeing God step out and do that makes all the unhealing so worth it because that was a beautiful healing, and I'm just so just thankful and gracious that God let, let that happen with one of my closest friends. So the first one is just expectation. Do we expect God to do this kind of thing? Second one is compassion. And this is huge. I think it also is largely where it begins. Do our hearts break as a community for those that are hurting? Jesus did all that he did out of love because he had compassion. Because he deeply cared for all who were burdened. He cared for all who were weary. All of the spiritual gifts, actually, in particular healing, should be motivated solely out of the desire to reveal the compassion and the love of Jesus to another person. All right, so it's so important. It's not about some kind of magic trick. It's not some kind of sign. It's not some kind of wonder. It's all about love. And then lastly, as we said, it's simply courage. It's faith enough to risk. We're not called to be spectators, right? We're called to be participants, and it is scary at times because, like you said, you don't fully know because we often fail. But it's not about us, right? Doing this kind of ministry is not about us. It's about us continually choosing to believe and obey and to love absolutely everyone that God puts in front of us. That's what he called us to do. He called us to love one another. He called us to go and pray for the sick. He called us to keep, keep teaching the good news. That's what we are called to do. And I don't want that, that framework to be just something that I came up with through my observations. I really see that played out through Jesus. And so there's just a, a, a short story from Matthew 20 where I see those three things, right? Expectation, compassion, and courage playing out in his ministry. Matthew 20, 29, he says this. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes 
Immediately they received their sight and followed him. The first thing we see here is that Jesus stops. And that's the first thing for all of us, right? We have to stop. Jesus stops here because he's carrying an expectation that his father has a plan, that his father is up to something, that the kingdom of God is actually breaking in in power, and therefore he's going through his day with the expectation that God is going to do something. And I think many of us don't find ourselves end up stopping for these moments because we're not carrying an expectation that God's going to actually do anything out of the ordinary. And then once he stops, what we see is that Jesus has compassion on them. And healing always starts with compassion, right? It is motivated out of love. And then we see in the story, though, compassion leads to a move in power. And Jesus has the courage to act, right? That's that courage piece. Courage comes from confidence in the power of God. And obviously, Jesus, more than anybody else, carried this confidence in the power of his Father more than anybody on earth. He himself, though, claimed to do nothing other, except by the power of the Holy Spirit. He came to do the work of his father, and he did amazing things, and yet he said that same spirit of which he did this miraculous ministry, that same spirit that raised him from the dead is the exact same spirit that is placed and given into each one of us that calls upon his name, and he says that you will do even greater things than me. Now, we're we're actually going to start as a church to continue to equip, because like we said, we can grow, and we can become strengthened in these kinds of things. You also just like practice, and you learn, and you understand as we grow in the gifts. But I, 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 so... We were going to hold seminars and classes on this kind of thing, but I just wanted to like briefly feel like I need to just share the basics because I think God's doing something. And if I'm going to do like a quick how-to, and I want to make it as simple as absolutely possible. Um, so just for this Sunday, um, I, think, I just want you to think of it like uh, a waiter, right? Anybody waited tables? Many, many times. I right? got some waiters. Yeah, double hands. All right, here we go. Present waiting, I'm sure. Um, okay, so I was a waiter at one point too, right? And there was these times I was at a seafood and steak restaurant. And there would be times where I had the opportunity to just, you know, basically just bless people with awesome meals like lobster and steak and all the stuff. It was amazing. And oftentimes when people would have a great meal, they would come and they would just thank me for such a wonderful meal. I had nothing to do with it, right? The chef prepared this amazing meal. All I did was bring out the plates. Truly all the glory goes to the one who created it, Right? Uh, J. Rodman Williams says something about this, right? He says, this is the only gift that is gifts, right? It was referred gifts of healing. Thus, the one who receives such gifts does not directly perform the healings. Rather, he simply transmits the gifts, the delivery boy who brings the gifts to others. That is what this healing thing is all about. So all you need to do really is, is see someone, ask them what's wrong, or if you see something that is wrong, ask if you can pray for them. You could simply just ask if you could place your hand on them because we see that throughout scripture. The laying on of hands, we see us commanded, call the elders, have them anoint with oil and lay on the hands. We see there's something in the power of laying on of hands. Sometimes if you want, you can actually place it on the area that's hurt if it's appropriate, okay? So if you don't want to do that, like the default of any of this is just don't make it weird. Be loving, be kind. That's why pretty much all the time in this church what we say is appropriate is just a hand on the shoulder. We pray just with a hand on the shoulder that we lay on hands, that we make a connection. And you invite the Holy Spirit to come. And you ask for healing in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Please heal this person. If you really want to be fancy and do a fancy prayer, you can actually name the area that needs healing, right? As in the name of Jesus, I command this tumor to shrink. In fact, that's a very similar prayer that happened uh, just a month ago that we actually witnessed God move in power and shrink a tumor. And if it doesn't work immediately or only works partially, that sometimes happens, go ahead and do it again. You can ask the person what they're experiencing. Jesus did that at times, right? We see Jesus sometimes uh, asked to do it again. There was a a blind man who could only partially see, and so Jesus took a second crack at it. So if Jesus takes a second crack at it, maybe we could all take like 10,000 cracks at it. (laughs) Right, and so I just wanna like demystify this thing as natural as possible, but it involves expectation and courage. Right, expectation, compassion on one another, and courage to step out, but it's not about you, it's all about the love of Jesus. Right, and it's not a formula, it's not some fancy thing, it's not about the minister and some power conference, it's about the Holy Spirit who loves and indwells each person, and he wants the church to be the church. I love this, how, how Jordan's saying in a book called Miracle Work, where he kind of just like blows up the, the way that there's not really a template for all of this, and I'm just going to read this quote, because I think it's probably the most helpful way to see it. He says, one of the most fascinating things about studying healing ministry in scripture is the wonderfully diverse way the many stories of healing unfold. Peter's mother-in-law was healed as soon as Jesus took her hand. 
but the 10 lepers didn't experience their healing until after Jesus had sent them away. Jesus healed a servant's ear by touching it, but the hemorrhaging woman was healed when she sneaked up on Jesus and touched him. Jairus' daughter was resurrected from death immediately when Jesus called her, but the blind man in Bethsaida needed Jesus to touch him twice before he saw clearly. Jesus ordered a man to stretch out his withered hand, and the man was healed as he tried the impossible. But the centurion's servant was healed over a considerable distance just by Jesus' word. The paralytic, lowered down to Jesus through a roof, was first given of his, forgiven of his sins and then healed. But when Jesus healed the, the man born blind, he assured his disciples that sin played no part in the affliction. Jesus first delivered the hunchback woman from a demonic spirit of infirmity and then touched her spine to heal it. But the Canaanite girl wasn't even present when Jesus delivered and healed her through a proclamation to her mother. Jesus distributed healings through touch, commands, and declarations. Sometimes he applied saliva, sometimes mud, sometimes just touching his cloak was enough. All right, I share that just to be like, there's not a template, there's not a formula. It's about being in relationship with Jesus. Desiring to become more and more like him and then having the boldness, the compassion, and the courage to step out and do the things that Jesus did. And you can come up, I'm gonna close this out here. Um, I just wanna circle back, right? There's a mystery in healing. There's a mystery in how it all plays out, but we know that God heals. I know that God heals, and I know he desires to do it through us. There's evidence of that desire of God throughout all of scripture from beginning to end. There's evidence of this breaking out throughout all of scripture. There's evidence throughout all of church history. And God is desiring to move through the faith and love of his children, of his church. There's something that I think embodies kind of where we're going and what we've been doing is is John Wimber who famously said this, when we prayed for no one, no one got healed. And now we pray for everyone and some people get healed. I love that so much, and that is so true, and that is what we are seeing, and that's what we are experiencing, and we say that because we want people to be healed. We want people to know Jesus. We want people to be set free. We believe in the sozo, the salvation that Jesus came to say, I have come for the totality of the person. There's not a single part of you, there's not a single place in your life that I don't want to see forgiven and redeemed. It's that process, right, of the kingdom breaking in, And as that kingdom is breaking in into this imperfect and broken world, it's okay to fail. I just want to mention this, right? We we fail at evangelizing all the time, don't we? Does that mean we should stop talking about Jesus? I mean, each each time I preach, there's plenty of times I preach and I've I've wanted people to repent, right? And and to be baptized, and and they don't. Sometimes I'm sure it's probably because it wasn't a very good message. It didn't land very well. Maybe they didn't have the ears to hear. I don't know, but I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep sharing the good news, and I'm going to keep telling people that Jesus loves them. I wouldn't stop that just because I'd say the truth of the gospel once, and then they're, they're not saved when I stop. The same is true with healing. Right, right, say I was preaching to 100 non-Christians, and I were to preach this, this, this sermon of salvation, and 10 people got saved. That means 90 were not, but 10 people got saved. That's 10 people who got eternity forever. That's 10 people who were set free and given purpose and identity and calling in their life to live life in all their fullness. Would that not be completely worth it? Would we want not, not want to do that again? Honestly, would it not be worth it if that was one person? And so say each one of you goes out from this place to pray healing in your workplace. To pray for 100 people, which, sidebar, that's, that's a lot of people to pray for. That's maybe a really good goal. Right? That would be 100 bus stops or 100 cubicles or 100 studios or, or 100 corners at the park. That each one of you is now praying for the kingdom of God to be made known. Where that is, that is 100 locations where people are encouraged by the love of your obedience to Jesus Christ. And what if, what if uh, 99 of those times nothing happened, right? It was awkward, maybe. Pers- person still injured or still hurt. There would still be 99 people who were cared for and prayed for and loved and encouraged. And also if there was that one, right? If just one of those times the spirit moves in power and a headache goes away or a tumor is removed, right? Or a back is healed, is it not completely worth it? Because that one and more than one in 100 is what we're starting to see as people step out in boldness and faithfulness. 
from, from, from backs to feet to tumors to, 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 to marriages, right? We're talking physical and spiritual. That God encompasses the whole of the person. And each time people are stepping out in boldness and God is moving in power, every time there is a breakthrough, that is one more glimpse of eternity. Right? That's one more light, ray of light that is bursting into darkness. That is one more time where the kingdom of God is advancing and we are moving from that already to the not yet, but we're moving toward that not yet and we're seeing the glory of God break through here in New York City. I just want to say, God doesn't ask us to have all the answers. God does not ask us to keep score. He asks us to pray. He asks us to pray. To have compassion on everybody that he puts in front of us and to have belief and faith and courage that he has come to save. And it's my heart that Wellspring more and more would be known as a church that prays, a church that radically loves people, as a church that is expressing the love and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that will come as we grow in our expectation that he will do it. And it will come as we grow in our compassion for other people. And it will come as we have the courage to step out and to participate in the ministry of Jesus. And so what I'd like to do this morning is just to raise our level of faith. And I want to pray, but not just me pray, I want all of us to pray. I think there's certain things that are stirring up in people's hearts in this. For some of us, it is that like thudding in our heart about risk and that idea that you know you've been being called to risk, that you know you've been called to step forward in greater courage. And I believe God wants to like infuse you with greater courage today to send you out. Sensing some in this room too, though, are in in a place where you know you've had a framework of of the gospel, but it's come more out of a place of your experience, and not just from going to scripture and trusting and believing that God could actually just be God, in the way that He He says in the page and in the book. And that today actually might just be a time of like confession or openness to say, uh, God, I want to experience the things you talk about, not just the things in the framework that I've built up. I also think there's some people here that are like, okay, if this is a thing, I actually have some stuff I need prayed for. So I guess why not give it a shot? Let's just pray together in this moment. Will you join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, we invite you to come in this place. Come, Holy Spirit. we want to take you at your word we want to grow in the gifts we want to experience your fullness we want to see healing in this city we want to see healing in this church I'm going to ask for you in particular if there, there's a longing in your heart to experience more that, that fullness or when I mention more about the Holy Spirit or this gift of healing and you're wanting it I want to actually invite you to stand up standing up. This takes a little bit more risk than raising the hand, right? You can stand right now if you want more. You can stand right now if you're saying, I want, I want more of the gift of healing. I want more of the Holy Spirit. I just want my faith to rise. gifts on your church. Rising the level of faith like the level of the tide. Come Lord Jesus, we want to see your spirit flow. We're waiting on you. Come Holy Spirit, fill us. You said you would come to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. experiencing your feeling, God, we just ask for more of it on each person right now, more, more of what you're doing.
We're going to open up the rest of this time too for, or even just like a laying down and meeting with the Lord, like even a place of confession and confession, not just of sin, but of just of longing for more, of like a crying out of saying, I want this. We have these rugs in the front that you can come and kneel and just meet with your father in a personal and intimate way. I also have this sense of this picture too for some people of, of, of like a puddle with oil in it. And it's gross discussing oil and oil and water don't mix, right? And water is the Holy Spirit. Water is that fresh, pure Holy Spirit. And it doesn't work with that oil. And there's this, this oil, there's this gook, there's this yuck that we're carrying due to what this world has put on us in that brokenness. And you want to be separated from that. If that's for you, I believe you should come forward and pray and just kneel down and lay that before your Father and be cleansed because I believe he's wanting to do some cleansing today. And also we'll have prayer partners here. And if, if physical healing is for you, in, in particular, I would love for you to come forward and receive prayer with one of our prayer partners. We'd love to believe in faith and pray for God to come and heal you this morning. But really, there's no rules, right? The front of the church, prayer partners, or even each one of you that is in the seats right now can turn and pray with somebody else. Because time and again, we see that healing and the gifts of the Spirit is not for the spiritual elite. It's for the church. It's for all people. And Jesus said in John 20, so I want to read this over here as we, as we enter into a time of response that Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, Jesus breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit.